Okay, so uh, good everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, good morning, if you're um, further to the west. Um, so before we start our talk, I'm just going to um, let you know what we've got coming up. We try and do around two of these talks a month. Um, we have another one next week with Dr. Malta Fuhrman, who's going to be talking about the port cities of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, urban culture in the late Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then uh, in June, a month later, we may have something in between, the characters of Yusuf Franco and Ottoman bureaucrats caricatures by Dr. Özgür Ertem. Um, same time, uh, same place, but um, I promise to turn up on time next time. Um, let's move straight on to uh, the talk this evening um, by Caleb Hellman Adney. Um, we're delighted that uh, he can join us um, from Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and he's going to talk about portfolio habits, uh, commercial networks, oriental tobacco, and extraterritoriality in the age of international finance. A little bit of background on Herman. Um, Kerman, uh, Caleb Herman Adney is a PhD candidate whose dissertation research revolves around the political economy of late Ottoman Macedonia and Thrace and the tobacco industry in particular. He is also interested in the cultural and economic history of the Eastern Mediterranean more generally and the legal and financial institutions used by commercial networks in their transactions. In terms of the tobacco trade, uh, he argues that interactions between bureaucracy, legislation and local political administration on the one hand and commercial networks, economic privileges and credit markets on the other was central to economic development, uneven as it was. Political economy in the age of the market therefore shaped both illicit trade through smuggling networks and violent activism in the form of nationalist activism as much as it did legal commerce and officially sanctioned social organizations. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite Herman to expand on that. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, pass on to Herman. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And um, Craig, am I able to share my screen now? Oh yes, it looks like I can. Okay, so let me do that. Okay. Okay, so to begin, um, of course I have to begin with a thank you to the Levantine Heritage Foundation in general, but especially its chairman, Quentin Compton Bishop and the general secretary, Craig and Jed, uh, and to all of you for attending this talk. So I'd like to lay out some of the goals of the talk to begin with so that it's clear as we move forward what I'm trying to do. First of all, I am, trying, I am going to attempt to give a brief theoretical and historiographical overview of my dissertation research in general for some context uh, of the historical issues that it will cover. Um, my dissertation is tentatively titled Habits of the Market, Commercial Networks, Regional Finance and Resistance in the Ottoman Tobacco Trade circa 1858 to 1912. It attempts to analyze the cultural history of commerce in Macedonia and Thrace during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And it highlights the centrality of Ottoman legal, financial and economic institutions, which were central to the experience of tobacco merchants and to commercial life more generally. But second, the second goal of this talk today is to provide a working theory on the place of extraterritoriality and the Levantine heritage in the context of Ottoman tobacco and international finance, both before and after the establishment of the Regie Company in 1883, which was a financial conglomerate created by three separate European banks. Uh, that trifecta was the Imperial Ottoman Bank, the Vienna-based Credit Anstalt, and the Bleichroder Group in Berlin. But more on that in uh, a few moments. Extraterritoriality is central to this talk for a number of reasons. First among them 
is that it is one of the themes in my research that seemed to me like it would be the most interesting to this audience in particular, given the uh, Levantine Heritage Foundation's dedication to the legacy of Levantine communities, uh, which often maintained their extraterritorial extra status during the early modern and modern periods. Uh, second, it is extraterritoriality that is, is central to understanding the intervention I'm, uh, I'm trying to make with my writing in general and with my dissertation in particular, which is to highlight the multiplicity of ways that economic privileges associated with European financial and political entities were filtered through local political economy and Ottoman institutions. In this sense, I hope to make it clear just how crucial regional commercial networks, uh, both those with and without extraterritorial privileges, were to economic development and the actual social experience of the abstract category of extraterritoriality. Um, so without further ado, let me jump into portfolio habits, commercial networks, oriental tobacco, and extraterritoriality in the age of international finance. My research deals with commercial networks, and so as a result, it vacillates between various geographies. Um, for the most part, I look at Kavala and its hinterlands. So if you can see my cursor, then this right here is Salonika, and uh, slightly to the east is Kavala, and in this region of Macedonia and Thrace are a number of tobacco producing uh, towns and townships, which uh, I look at. I also, however, analyze a number of networks rooted in Salonika itself and in Salonika's financial and commercial apparatus. It is not a perfect generalization, but prominent families of Jewish or Donme extraction were dominant in Salonika, while Christian and Muslim entrepreneurs were more active in Kavala and the surrounding towns of Siroz, Drama, and Iskice, or Ceres, Drama, and Xanti today in northern Greece. Because of the legal mechanisms of the Tanzimat era, such as the Nizamie court system, and specifically the commercial courts, and also the political reorganization which took place in the empire during the 1850s and 1860s, most of these cities were linked to Salonika in more ways than one. Legal procedures, for example, often ended up um, in Salonika, commercial resources and credit were often funneled through that city, and commercial networks often needed representative or at least associate uh, representatives or at least associates who operated out of Salonika, whether or not the firm was based there. So apart from these geographic elements, my research attempts to trace the transformation of social relations in the tobacco industry in more ways than one. These include the commercial and financial cultures shared by tobacconists and the ways in which they included or excluded certain commercial actors. Secondly, the uneven development of class dynamics within the industry and the spectrum of economic experience amongst tobacco merchants, cultivators, and working peoples. Thirdly, the ways in which tobacco contributed to ethno-religious modes of identity formation in the region in two ways. Firstly, as a structural effect of the broader political environment, to borrow the language of Timothy Mitchell, a prominent historian, um, by which I mean that tobacco merchants often adopted an ethno-religious identity paradigm, which influenced their commercial activities. And secondly, as a generative material force within the construction of nationalist infrastructure. That is to say, tobacco contributed a significant material element to nationalist commercial networks. The tobacco industry and the broader political economy of the region was defined by what I call a culture of accumulation. And that culture was made up of commercial networks, which utilized both social and real capital to expand their reach with, it, with the goal of accumulating more capital. Um, so this included uh, market and personal networks, some of which were more important than others, as we'll see, uh, legal expertise, extraterritorial status, and actual real money wealth. Um, also financial institutions, which were, the main, which were one of the main means of accumulating capital through credit and so on. And also resistance, which was born out of the unequal dynamics of capital accumulation between commercial elites, lower class merchants, and so on during the era of international financial control. The interaction between these, these spheres of commercial life reflected the culture of accumulation. Uh, it was defined by commercial norms and behaviors, including immaterial factors which shaped commercial networks, 
such as religion and ethnicity, which are not an implicit part of the term political economy, which is why I don't use that term uh, all the time, but sometimes I prefer to use the, the term culture of accumulation. Um, it, this term also, this, this view also provides a vantage point on the linkages between seemingly contradictory phenomena, such as illicit trade and legal commerce <clears throat> or violent nationalist activism and multi-communal civil organizing. So participating in the market and in the culture of accumulation more generally did not cost the same for all merchants, nor were the risks of investing in tobacco experienced in a predictable uniform fashion. For one, some merchants were either less privileged or traded exclusively on the domestic market, which would become the domain of the Regi company when it attained the domestic monopoly in 1883. More on that in just a minute. Secondly, regional credit markets were not by any means equitable, nor were they incredibly advanced. A relatively small number of elite merchants maintained access to formal institutional credit through European banks, such as the Ottoman Bank, uh, which established its Salonika branch in 1864, the Banque de Salonique, which was established in 1888, but established a Kabbalah branch in 1893, and later on the Banque d'Orient, which was established in 1904. For most entrepreneurs, however, especially those who operated as independent exporters, especially in Kavala, whether or not they enjoyed extraterritorial privileges, they often traded credit as a commodity within a primitive regional financial sector that relied on bills of exchange and personal agreements to advance credit and transfer funds. Startup and investment costs are of course related to the issue of credit, but they are listed here separately because of the diverse portfolios enjoyed by the most prominent export firms, such as the Alatini brothers, which would later become the commercial company of Salonika Limited and the Salonika Cigarette Company. Fourth, uh, the freedom to operate was not guaranteed to all. And in fact, the firms which obtained special permission from the Ottoman government and the Regi company to operate without interference were actually few in number. Solomon Alatini was among those when he obtained a special permission from the Ottoman state to export tobacco duty-free to the Austro-Hungarian domains in 1863. <clears throat> this came on the heels of an 1862 legislative measure which disallowed other tobacco merchants from enjoying the same privilege. Again, more on this uh, in just a moment. Finally, commercial elites and well-established merchants were in an overall better position because of their ability both to avoid legal disputes in general but also to afford legal fees if and when they went to court against other merchants. This was not an insignificant privilege as a number of Ottoman merchants, both those with and without extraterritorial privileges, went bankrupt or, or had to immigrate to the neighboring states in order to avoid legal fees that they could not afford. This became an issue, for example, um, in 1878 uh, when the Bulgarian territories were in question. The above mentioned factors all worked together to create high transaction costs for many local merchants, and they were accompanied by limited compensation and poor working conditions for cultivators and workers. This meant that the social relations created by the culture of commerce and finance in the tobacco industry were not merely reflective of a sort of Marxian or Marxist class division between laborers and bosses, but also between competing business interests. So very briefly, I don't plan to dwell on this slide for very long, but I have provided here a basic timeline of some of the important developments that I will be discussing in a sort of chronological format, so that as I move forward, you can keep this in mind and perhaps make some more sense of the events and people that I will be discussing. And this timeline is really only for the Kavala tobacco trade. It's not um, a general timeline of tobacco, um, of, of developments in the tobacco industry at large although of course there is some overlap there. So in the 1850s, the first company headquarters were established in Kavala and those included the Alatinis, uh, the Abbots and a number of independent exporters. And during these years, the late 1850s in particular, significant exports to Central and Western Europe uh, took place. In the 1860s, a number of developments took place both in terms of legislation as well as the establishment of new privileges for commercial elites. In 1861, there was a ban on the importation of tobacco from abroad, which was meant to allow the local and regional tobacco industry to uh, thrive, to grow. And in 1862, Ottoman legislation 
new Ottoman legislation was written and published to impose new transportation fees and export duties on um, independent merchants. In 1863, there was a dispensation given to the Alatini family to export duty-free in part for supplying the Austrian tobacco monopoly, which essentially um, uh, made them uh, it made it so that they were not responsible for the articles of the 1862 legislation that I just mentioned. In the 1870s, uh, a number of new independent exporters established headquarters in Kavala, and as such, the illegal tobacco trade, uh, that of merchants avoiding customs duties, expanded greatly. At the same time, the European consular presence in the city expanded, and in 1874, new legislation on tobacco exports and cultivation was written, which mostly reiterated the, the, the rules of the game established in 1862. In 1875, however, the Ottoman government, which most of you probably are well aware already, had to declare bankruptcy because of loans that it had obtained from foreign governments, foreign entities, um, beginning in the Crimean War. So by the 1880s, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration was established in 1881 as a mechanism for, uh, for the Ottoman government to repay that foreign debt. The Regie Company was established as a monopoly holder over the tobacco industry, the domestic tobacco industry in 1883, and the Ottoman Public Debt Administration at that time handed over uh, its rights to tobacco revenues to the Regie Company, and it became the, the actual revenue collector. This led to a number of disputes between independent exporters and the Regie Company, and the expansion of smuggling networks in the region. From the 1890s until the end of Ottoman rule in the Balkans, there was increased violence for various reasons. Many of, much of that violence within the context of tobacco was class-based, that is to say, between laborers and bosses, but also nationalists between commercial organizations which uh, organized themselves around a nationalist idea. There was also the expansion of the Austro-Hungarian market in Kavala and associated companies in Kavala uh, as such. So those are some of the main sort of time, that's the timeline, that's the main developments that I, I want to keep in mind as we move forward. It's not to say we have to remember everything, but um, it will help to make sense of some of the things I will, I will now get into. So the Alatini family was a Jewish family in Salonika with a lineage dating back to the Iberian expulsion, and it maintained capitulatory privileges throughout the Ottoman period with various powers, including Italy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and France. This family was incredibly uh, important to local industry. They dominated beer making, bread making, and brick making, as well as many of the agricultural exports in and around Salonika, including tobacco. And it's really hard to actually overestimate their importance to local society and to uh, especially the Jewish commercial uh, elite in the city of Salonika. This excerpt, for example, is from a Ladino, Ladino language newspaper in which one member of the family, Carlo Alatini, um, was greeted upon landing at the port of Salonika in 1877 by parades and all of the prominent members of the Jewish, uh, the official Jewish community of the city. And he was uh, even, even accompanied into the city off of the port by a live Italian band. Most Jewish, working class people would not have had such a reception upon landing at the port of Salonika. So it goes to show that this family was incredibly well revered and incredibly important for local society. And this extends to commerce. Solomon Alatini, another member of the family, became deeply invested in tobacco in the 1850s and 1860s. And this was, as I've shown you, a relatively early phase of the industry's expansion. <clears throat> He leveraged his Austro-Hungarian subjecthood and his close ties with Istanbul and Salonika-based elites to dominate much of the tobacco industry from early on in its development. The dominance of the industry by those with Austro-Hungarian consular affiliation, including Alatini, the Alatinis, but also others, um, was a theme that would continue throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in fact, even into the period of Greek rule 
and the massive expansion of Kavala's tobacco industry in the interwar years, the Austrian firms active in Kavala remained uh, incredibly influential and accumulated massive amounts of capital through Thracian and Macedonian labor. Another very important figure in the early years of tobacco production was John Jack Abbott, or Jack Abbott Pazirgan, as he's known in the Ottoman documentation on him. Jack Abbott was one of the first merchants to set up shop in Kavala in 1858, following the Alatini brothers, for the purposes of tobacco exportation. He was also heir to a significant legacy of British origin merchants, and his family originally came to the Ottoman Empire as British subjects, and then integrated into the Greek Orthodox community by marriage. His grandfather, Bartholomew Edward Abbott, pictured here on the left, married a Greek woman from Izmir, and increased his riches in Salonika by investing in the leech industry of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Medicinal leeches were quite popular at this time, and so this was no small industry. Bartholomew's grandson, uh, Jack Abbott, became one of the most prominent leech exporters in the region. Um, but at a certain point in the mid 19th century, he ventured beyond parasitic worm selling and started to invest in tobacco production. By 1858, as I mentioned, he had headquarters in Kavala and was purchasing tobacco from peasant cultivators in nearby Yenije. He seems to have done quite well in and around Kavala and by 1860 was selling large amounts of tobacco to customers in Europe. However, there were a number of issues that he ran into with the Ottoman bureaucracy. The case of his relationship with the Ottoman bureaucracy and his interactions with customs agents stand in stark contrast to the documentation that we have available on the Alatini company and other firms which, <clears throat> which exported to the Austro-Hungarian domains and who enjoyed Austrian subjecthood. Some of the details of his experience, I believe, are enlightening in this regard. First, the Treaty of Balta Liman had established precedent in 1838 for merchants who enjoyed European capitulatory protections to avoid much of the taxation imposed on merchants within the Ottoman Empire. The treaty was designed to ensure free trade for British merchants and those who enjoyed British capitulatory privileges, but it extended to merchants affiliated with other European powers as well. Disagreements about the terms of this treaty and the implications of European protections more generally would contribute to tensions between merchants and the state in the late 1850s and 1860s. In Jack Abbott's case, this conflict came to the fore, and in the late 1850s and early 1860s, he became involved in a dispute with tax officers of the village of Poroi in the Ottoman district of Siros. Um, the... Uh, this conflict um, eventually reached the governor of Salonika's ears, uh, to whom Jack Abbott complained of unnecessary bureaucratic interference in his business affairs. From his perspective, that is Jack Abbott's perspective, the legal precedent of Walter Liman ought to have left him free to transport and ship his product at will. <clears throat> this is not, of course, how the local bureaucracy interpreted the issue. This was one of many such instances of confusion over the jurisdiction of Ottoman bureaucracy within customs collection. And also the limits, and, and it also demonstrates the limits of extraterritorial privileges within the mid 19th century context. Merchants whose extraterritorial status reflected a central European commercial pedigree and who specifically provided product to the Austrian tobacco monopoly had a much different experience with the Ottoman bureaucracy than that which I have described in relation to Jack Abbott. So in part because of bureaucratic corruption and confusion over the commercial application of extraterritorial privileges like those of Jack Abbott, the Ottoman government issued new legislation in 1862 explicitly requiring customs duties of 12% from all export merchants regardless of nationality or capitulatory privilege. This legislation, however, was selectively enforced and allowed for a very small number of merchants such as the Alatini family to export tobacco to Trieste, Vienna, and Munich without paying customs duties. <clears throat> By 1859, the amount of tobacco shipped from the ports of Salonika and Kavala to the Austrian domains, mainly to Trieste from Kavala, had increased significantly as would tobacco transported to Hungary via Rumelian land routes. The Alatinis became well integrated into this commodity chain and made use of an industrial labor force in Austria 
that was quite advanced relative to that of Kabbalah and Salonika at mid-century. In short, it seemed that market networks within the Austrian domains were a better guarantee of avoiding transaction costs and economic risk than international treaties like Baltaliman in Macedonia and Thrace. Extraterritorial status in this sense was certainly an important factor in the accumulation of capital, both for the Alatinis and the abbots, but the specific geographic and bureaucratic context ensured that market networks as well as personal networks played a more crucial role in guaranteeing the Alatini's full potential of their legal status as subjects of the Habsburg Empire. By showing this example and this contrast between Jack Abbott and the Alatini family, or Salomon Alatini in particular, I'm not arguing that extraterritorial status did not matter. It mattered a great deal. A major source of economic power was the broad export markets and diverse sources of credit available to those who enjoyed extraterritorial status. This allowed merchants and commercial elites of Salonika and the surrounding region to mostly avoid reliance on local credit markets, which remained fickle and informal based on uh, agreements between merchants were in financial instruments, um, mostly bills of exchange, were traded both as credit and commodity. When the most prominent Levantine families and regional elites were involved in these local credit markets, it was usually in their capacity as lenders and not as borrowers. This uh, document in particular shows just that. It is a document taken from the uh, Salonika Commercial Court, the Ottoman Commercial Court uh, from 1885. And the Ottoman portion, the Arabic script, is the form basically of the protest or the petition itself, which would be presented to the court. Whereas this uh, section written in Greek is the original, is a copy of the original bill of exchange um, that was in question. So in this document, Liachi Modiano, who was a very prominent member of the commercial elite family, the Modianos, and who was also a prominent lawyer in the city, had lent 45 Ottoman lira to a local Greek speaking merchant. He was uh, demanding repayment of this loan. To reiterate my point very briefly about extraterritoriality being an important component of, our, of capital accumulation, I provide here an image of the Salonika branch of the Imperial Ottoman Bank after it was bombed in 1903 um, by uh, anarchists which had been originally founded in the home of Jack Abbott in 1864. So although Jack Abbott's ventures into tobacco did not accelerate in the same way that those with Austro-Hungarian protection had, as I briefly tried to describe above, this did not mean that he was somehow an insignificant member of the regional and trans transnational elite of the Macedonian and Thracian trading community, but rather that um, the specifics of market networks in tobacco were, were enjoyed more thoroughly by those with Austro-Hungarian connections. So as briefly mentioned, international finance would come to play a major role in the tobacco industry in the 1880s and the 1890s when the Regie company took over the monopoly of domestic tobacco production and sales um, in accordance with the three banks that I mentioned earlier and the Ottoman Public Debt Administration or OPTA. OPTA itself had been established as a means of enforcing a repayment plan on the Ottoman Empire for its massive debt to foreign creditors dating back to the Crimean War when the Ottoman Empire first began amassing a substantial foreign debt. By 1875, the empire defaulted on these loans and declared bankruptcy, leading eventually to the establishment of OPTA and subsequently to the Regie Company. Under this new set of circumstances, the tobacco trade had become collateral in a sense and the revenues collected from tobacco cultivators and merchants had become integrated into the Ottoman repayment plan. This, this very definitively placed the Ottoman tobacco trade within the orbit of international financial control, which is uh, the terminology of Joshkin Tunjer, but I think it describes the situation quite well. Um, it, it placed the tobacco trade within the orbit of international financial control in a way that it had not been before. <clears throat> the Regie Company was only supposed to have jurisdiction over the domestic trade. However, because it was allowed to collect revenues on exported tobacco, enforce its registration upon sale, and employ surveillance teams, the company's reach into the export trade would actually be quite significant. Due to the fact that merchants, such as the Alatini brothers, had already come to play such an important role in the local industry and 
also they would soon be accompanied by the Herzog Company established in 1890. And also due to the fact that a number of merchants in and around Kavala had been operating as independent exporters, the regie enforced measures to control independent operatives, register tobacco sales, and to limit potential smuggling activities. These measures affected many tobacco exporters regardless of their political status. <clears throat> The first years of the regime's existence were especially confusing for all of those involved as the regime's entrance into credit markets, surveillance, registration, and tax collection made it unclear what the social experience of these measures would actually be in the long run. Even the most prominent of those involved were forced to further diversify their portfolios in case the regime's policies caused the tobacco trade to unravel and deteriorate. So here on the left, for example, is a document which describes this decision by the Alatini family to um, establish a branch of their tobacco trade in Egypt under the name the Salonica Cigarette Company. And this was in response to Rigi policy in, in 1887 when it was unclear how they would be affected by um, monopoly policies in the long run. So establishing the Salonica Cigarette Company in Egypt was seen by them as a supplement to their continued activities in Kabbalah. In the long run, the Alatini family was not much affected by Regi company policy, especially because after 1893, they, along with the aforementioned Herzog Company, made an agreement with the Regi Company to allow them to continue exporting tobacco to Austro-Hungarian domains without any company interference. <clears throat> On the right-hand side uh, is a document uh, of a very different type, or at least it's the front page uh, in a series of documents dedicated to a case on uh, Kalistos Theophilidis, who was a Kavala-based export merchant with a much more modest pedigree. Um, and he was, so he was not only a businessman in Kavala, but he also had Russian subjecthood. In spite of his Russian subjecthood, he was still accused of smuggling by the Regi, and much like others in the region whose cases ended up in Regi company folders or reports on, 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 on smuggling, um, and more than a few times became the subject of court cases raised at the Salonika Commercial Court as well. Another example of this kind of thing is this case of Lukas Grigoriadis, who was a merchant who was accused of smuggling by the regime and who was brought to the Salonika Commercial Court and, uh, and, and fought regime policy for many years um, because from his perspective, he was not a smuggler in spite of their claims. And so this is a page from a nine page document in the Salonika Commercial Court uh, on this exact conflict between him and the regime company on the regime's uh, uh, jurisdiction. Much like Grigoriadis, there were other merchants who, with, who did not enjoy a connection to the Austro-Hungarian market and for whom extraterritoriality did not always pack the same punch as it had for people like the Alatinis. One such merchant was Petros Vulgaridis, who was the local Kavala representative of the French consulate. And in addition to this privileged political position that he was afforded, he also uh, was a well-known independent tobacco merchant, meaning that he exported tobacco purchased on his own wealth. And in the mid to late 1880s, he ran into a number of issues because of the newly established policies of the Regie Company. In particular, the requirements imposed by the Regie on export merchants to register their tobacco with the company and to submit to its surveillance measures did not go over well with him. He was accused of smuggling tobacco in spite of the fact that his commercial domain, that of exportation, was not supposedly within the regime's jurisdiction. His experience, though, was not unique in this sense, and the application of regime policies which challenged export merchants' perceived independence from regime surveillance provoked a much broader response from the business community of Kavala, many of whom, like Vulgaridis, enjoyed extraterritorial privileges. So here, for example, is a petition made to the Ottoman government by Volgaridis, as well as a number of other uh, businessmen in Kavala, challenging its policies and um, 
uniting their efforts to, to ask the Ottoman government to intervene on their behalf. This kind of united effort by Kavala merchants to challenge regime policy, I think of as commercial activism. And this type of activism is often framed as Ottoman merchants versus foreign domination of the industry, this sort of dichotomy. And this way of framing the issue contains both a truth and a lie. On the one hand, the Regie company, as I hope to have demonstrated by now, dominated much of the tobacco industry and it was foreign. So the foreign domination portion of this equation is partly true. However, it is false when commercial elites like the Alatini and Parachia families are presented as foreigners because of their extraterritorial privileges. As we have seen, a number of merchants with legal and political affiliation with European powers, even some of those who signed this document, did not enjoy the same successes in spite of their extraterritorial privileges. So instead of foreign versus Ottoman, it seems more helpful to think of the tobacco industry as being defined by regionality in terms of commercial networks, financial institutions, and political status or identity. In this way, it becomes more clear where the social fissures and tensions actually were within local society. The opportunities for the entrepreneurial expansion of independent exporters were limited and provoked various responses amongst those competing for limited commercial opportunities in an environment where the transaction costs, as I've mentioned, were significant and the risks of investing in the tobacco trade were quite high. One such response was commercial nationalism. For example, this document uh, is a petition written to the Ottoman government by a group of Bulgarian merchants who were attempting to establish um, a Bulgarian Ottoman merchant organization, something like a mutual aid society that would benefit Bulgarian Ottomans in particular, as opposed to their Greek and Muslim uh, compatriots in and around Kavala. This kind of commercial nationalism sometimes led to uh, nationalist violence outbursts, such as that documented in, in, in these pages. Um, in, in this newspaper uh, excerpt and this report also from the Greek Patriarchate in Constantinople or Istanbul, um, it is detailed that a Bulgarian merchant named Haji Yorgiev or Haji Yorgi was uh, murdered by a group of Greek merchants uh, who were trying to establish hegemony within the local tobacco industry. There was a, there was a different response, however, which, which uh, came up in the early 20th century and mirrored the mobilization of independent merchants from the 1880s and 1890s that I mentioned in the context of the Bulgaridis conversation. This took place at the close of the Regis monopoly, which was set to expire in 1913. This document is from 1911. Throughout the first decade of the 20th century, a number of organizations, including this, this one pictured here um, uh, from uh, the Kavala Tobacco Congress, which was hosted by the local branch office of the Committee for Union and Progress, advocated for, the, for a new Ottoman policy, which would not renew the agreement with the Regis after its expiration. Instead, they hoped to establish a new tobacco regime wherein enterprise would be relatively unobstructed and the dominant families in the local industry would not be given special privileges, regardless of their commercial networks, family history, or financial contributions to the Ottoman state. Of course, the Balkan Wars and World War I would bring about substantive political and social changes to the region. However, the ways in which extraterritoriality had been regionally implemented and the ways that commercial networks had formed and developed over time would leave a lasting legacy on the tobacco trade for the first decades of Greek rule. <clears throat> and I am nearing my, my conclusion here, so I just need a couple of more minutes. Extraterritorial status, such as the Austrian subjecthood enjoyed by Solomon Alatini, the French consular affiliation of Petros Bulgaridis, or the English subjecthood of Jack Abbott carried with it a plethora of legal, political, and commercial implications. Recent scholarship on extraterritoriality in the late 19th and early 20th century Eastern Mediterranean has emphasized the distinction between legal categories and social experience. Will Hanley, for example, has demonstrated that social status diverged from legal status in a number of ways within the context of Alexandrian residents with European political protections. Likewise, Sarah Stein has helpfully presented the social experience of extraterritoriality 
as a spectrum and not merely a reflection of set legal statuses or categories. In the context of Ottoman tobacco, I am attempting to graft the various modes of commercial activism against the regime company and Ottoman policy onto this spectrum of the social experience of extraterritoriality. In other words, extraterritoriality contributed to diverse commercial experiences as much as it did to social experiences. The legacies of extraterritoriality in the case of Ottoman tobacco, I believe, are threefold. One, extraterritorial status in the context of Kavala's tobacco exporting community and in the context of Macedonia and Thrace more generally, gave shape both to commercial networks and to the patterns of supply and demand in Central European markets. Secondly, the specific businesses and individuals who benefited from extraterritorial status the most in the tobacco trade were those who had access to flexible resources and whose networks extended into Anatolia, Europe, and the southern shores of the Mediterranean, as did the networks of the Alatini family and the Perachia family um, and Hassan Akif Pasha, who I will mention briefly in a moment. Thirdly, the extraterritorial status of tobacco merchants was, in many ways, filtered through the specific dynamics of regional competition, both in the pre-Regi period and in the end in the era of international financial control. What this means is that certain merchant families with connections to social capital and real capital in Salonika were able to expand their business interests and thrive in spite of political instability in the turbulent years following the Balkan Wars and World War I. So for example, Judah Perachia here pictured on this uh, paperwork to go to Egypt is one such case. He was able to leverage well-developed commercial networks and financial institutions in his favor while expanding his tobacco business and that of the Salonika Cigarette Company into Egypt and Palestine. <clears throat> Finally, in conclusion, uh, on the one hand, the scholarship on extraterritoriality has ballooned in recent years and has brought with it a number of interesting debates over the legacies of Ottoman legal and commercial practices. On the other hand, labor history and economic history has emphasized the importance of class to industrial relations and the dominance of the means of production by factory owners and bosses. In part, what I attempt to do by analyzing the enterprising activities of local businessmen in Kavala and the surrounding region is to demonstrate that the specific market networks, most impor importantly in this case the Austrian and German markets, and personal financial networks available to commercial agents, especially those of Western institutional finance, were crucial for shaping class dynamics amongst tobacco exporters in and around Kavala throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In this sense, the specific geographic and institutional realities of Ottoman commercial life need to be taken seriously when thinking about the multiple meanings of extraterritoriality and economic growth in the 19th and 20th centuries. I leave you here with an image of Hassan Akif Pasha, who um, died an untimely death in 1916 in Munich, but prior to the Ottoman losses in the Balkans, um, exported tobacco from both Salonika and Kavala and was a prominent member of the Salonika commercial elite. And throughout his decades of, of exporting tobacco and doing very well with it uh, on the Austrian and German markets, he never enjoyed extraterritorial privilege. He was, in fact, a loyal Ottoman subject. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Herman. Um, so we'll move now to questions. And uh, if you have a question, you can uh, wave uh, at me or you can put your question in the chat. Um, does anyone want to lead with a question? Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, Herman, how significant was the tobacco trade, and specifically you know, the trade between Salonika and Kavala and the European demand? Was it the main sort of export region, main supply? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. The Tobacco industry went through fits and starts, but um, it became, especially in the 1870s and 1880s, and all the way up through the interwar period, it really was the dominant industry of the region. Um, 
Other industries, like I mentioned, beer, uh, beer making, uh, bread making, other agricultural exports such as wheat and um, rye remained important, but tobacco really dominated the local commercial uh, life, especially of Kavala, but to, to a large degree Salonika as well. Um, and Kavala obtained this reputation later on in the Greek period as being the Mecca to Kaknu or the Mecca of tobacco, uh, but it, it had already become the Mecca of tobacco during the Ottoman years, actually. And um, yeah, so I would say that it was incredibly important and that it was specifically through these Austrian and German connections that it came to dominate the region so, so seriously. Tobacco had been grown in the region for many, many years. It had been grown in the, in the Yenije region all the way back to the 17th century, uh, if not the 16th century. It's unclear from the documentation, but we know that it was uh, grown in fairly large amounts, at least in the 17th century. So it has this longer, this longer arch, uh, this longer history, but in terms of an actual established profitable industry, that was something which happened after the 1850s and after the Crimean War. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone want to ask a question? Um, no, well, I'm going to keep going. Um, so clearly the Alatinis had this special relationship with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with the monopoly there. With the abbots, who were their main destination markets? Um, from the documentation that I have, they were exporting tobacco to, uh, to Western Europe predominantly, um, mostly the UK, uh, uh, but also to uh, a much, much more limited degree. They did export to, to Germany, but they did not have these robust commercial networks in Germany to support that as a sustainable endeavor. In other words, um, there are references to them exporting tobacco to Germany, but it's not part of their, it's not part of their mainstay. It's not part of what Jack Abbott did on a regular basis, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shebnam. Yes, I was wondering uh, what role uh, uh, Izmir and, and the Western Anatolia in tobacco production at the time was? Um... Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it is one which has continued to, I, I am still trying to figure out the answer to that question um, in the sense that I have some documentation on Izmir tobacco it seems to me, I have documentation of merchants in Kavala and Yenije and Salonika sending seeds to Izmir right. to help merchants in Izmir actually develop the, their own farms there and so on. So it mm -hmm. seems that, that uh, there was this connection in that way, but all the documentation I have seems to indicate that the Izmir industry started to develop at a, a slightly later period. Um, After the population, was population exchange played a role on that, you think? Well, yeah, in, a, in the sense, the population exchange played a role both in the, the development of the Izmir industry, but also the development of the Kavala industry. So both industries balloon uh, even more than what I've already described after the population exchange in mm -hmm. Kavala, it's because of the influx of Pontic Greeks, and in Izmir, it's because of the uh, influx of Balkan communities uh, and, and, and so on. So um, there is this transfer of technology and transfer of knowledge uh, between all three regions, the Black Sea region, the Aydin region, and, Salonia, uh, and Macedonia, essentially. Just to follow on from that, um, do, was there any evidence that the abbots had uh, sort of encouraged the abbots in the Smyrna region to take up tobacco? It's a great question and um, not one that I have read about. I, I have found references to the other abbots 
the other abbots living in Izmir and Aleppo, but I have not read that documentation to be completely frank with you. So I, I leave it for a future project. Um, but if anyone, because you mentioned to me yesterday, Quentin, uh, that I should ask my own questions too. If anyone has references or documentation on the Abbott family or the Alatini family or any of these other uh, merchants that I've, that I've mentioned, I would be all ears and be very, very happy to, to obtain um, any more references to these people, so. Okay, well, I will declare a personal interest as I'm sort of related to the Abbots. Um, so I'll, I'll have a look at our own documentation. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I noticed that there is this website, there's this portion of the website dedicated to the Abbots as well. So, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to Joanna and then to David Clark. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks, um, Herman, for your talk. Um, I have a, an interest in tobacco in, in Smyrna, and my uh, understanding of it was that a lot of the trade was done by a company called the American Tobacco Company, and I'm wondering if they were, I'm just guessing that they may have been a sort of um, umbrella kind of arrangement. Do you, do you know anything about them? Yeah, I know a little bit. Um, I found documentation in the Ottoman bank records housed in uh, Salt Galata um, for their activities in and around Izmir, as you mentioned. But also, after 1903, they become a very dominant, a very, a very uh, important firm in Kavala and in the neighboring city of Xanti or Iskice. So the American Tobacco Company, as well as the Gary Tobacco Company, another American firm, um, I wouldn't say that they come to dominate the local industry, but they come to play a, a critical role. And they sort of work alongside the, um, these Austro-Hungarian firms that I've already mentioned and, and extend the importance of tobacco to the new world context and start importing it to the United States and so on. Okay, yeah, it's a big subject. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, well, actually on the subject of America, I have a family connection with um, American tobacco importers, Kahaya. Does that ring a bell, does that name? I think the family originated from the Black Sea coast and Adnan was married to the son of the family and they, he, was, he traveled around Europe buying tobacco from the areas you talk of. <clears throat> but in, in addition, they bought, he bought a, a trading firm in Bremen. I, I, I think Bremen was a major trading center for tobacco in Europe. Um, and I just wanted um, to, because they, they would have bought for the big American tobacco companies. Um, I forgot. I haven't got the papers with me, um, but I just wonder if you if you come across that family. I have not, uh, but I, my my interest is absolutely peaked. So uh, perhaps. Well, I, I do know if you look up on Kahaya on the internet, you can find quite a few references to commercial cases in New York and importing tobacco. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, I've got letters uh, from this guy. I mean, it wasn't a successful marriage, but. It was mainly okay. about money, but um, it does, it, it tells you where he was traveling. But this was all in the early 30s, and he was acting uh, for his father, who ran the business from New York. Well, that is fascinating. Um, I'm really interested in, in the developments of the 1930s, because in the, in the East Kiche region in particular, the city right outside of Kavala, the Communist Party became very prominent. And the Communist Party became so prominent in part because of the dominance of local industry by these American companies. And also uh, merchants like Judah Parachia, who I mentioned in my, in my talk, he becomes the object of ire of local workers as well. And so I would love to take these documents that you've mentioned and sort of compare and contrast and see, okay, is he tied up in any of this? And, and how can I tie this story in? That sounds fascinating. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be in London in late June, so I'll try and fish him out. If I can have an address, I can try and copy relevant letters to you. Yeah. Uh, we we so, can make the connection. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, I'll move to Alan Millard. Uh, you're on mute, Alan. 
Uh, good evening and thanks for thank you very much. I have more of a comment or a contribution in the sense of um, uh, in my book um, on my family, uh, my mother's uh, stepfather's so father um, grandfather of mine. He, he was Ismail Jenani, and he was head of the Reji company in Istanbul in 1909. And I see that uh, reported to, so he, in 1910, he became the master of ceremonies at the palace. And in his, his team, uh, there are quite a few Greek names, I see, Spataris, I think Skylitsi, so, you know, there's more than one Potiades, Ades. So he's got a team. I mean, the, the, the team um, includes uh, Greek, obviously Greek, um, I mean, uh, Greek subjects, so to speak, or room subjects. I don't know whether this is just a reflection of the Ottoman Empire or because, um, as you are talking about the tobacco industry being so important in Thrace, whether they were particularly chosen because they could, you know, uh, communicate in, in Greek. It's that's a that's incredibly fascinating because one of the policies of the regime which changed over time was their uh, dis their disposition, let's say, to room or to Greek speaking merchants, because Greek speaking merchants in particular developed this reputation, and it's in the regime paperwork. They they have reports on this that say the majority of smugglers are Greeks. Uh, yeah. that, that is a perception of the regime. It's, it's not the entire truth. There are, there's more complexity to it there. Yeah. But they went through this phase where they tried out different uh, tactics. Sometimes they would try and employ more Greek speakers in order to, I suppose, um, connect, let's say, with those merchants and try to... to Put an end to smuggling in that way. At other times, they would say we don't trust uh, our Greek-speaking employees, and we're actually going to try and hire less of them from now on. So this this relationship to Greeks in who worked for the regime was actually quite uh, turbulent, let's say. Mm. Well, it's in it's it's published in the Annuaire Oriental Commerce, 1909. So wow. that's where the list is. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. No, pleasure. Oh, any any other questions from the floor? Um, I, I've got another one. Um, I mean, going back to the um, issue of uh, the dynamics of the extraterritoriality, um, was this similar dynamic seen in other trades, you know, such as the export of fruit or minerals? Um, or is it peculiar to the tobacco trade? <clears throat> In a sense, um, what, what I will say is that my intention with framing extraterritoriality in this way is to say that the geographic uh, dynamics are very important. And so the the way that commercial networks functioned um, prior to the establishment of the regime in a way set up the momentum or set the momentum for um, the Austro-Hungarian connections and the German connections to be the most prominent ones. Um, I'm certain that there are parallels in other industries, but that's not something that I can uh, speak to at this moment in, in, in a particular kind of way. I'd have to sort of think about it and compare it, for example, to um, the salt industry or or um, or uh, Chukarova cotton production or something like that. Um, but I don't have a better answer for you right off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Liz. Liz. Sorry, I can't Find the, hello, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Herman. I'm sorry I can't find the hand to say I want to chat. Just, first of all, in response to Joanna, my uncle by marriage was Charles Balladour, who headed up the American Tobacco Company 
in, I imagine, the 30s and 40s. And his best friend through life, throughout his life, was a man called Baxalis. Now, as you know, in Smyrna, in, certainly in Burnabato, in Bornova, everybody was known by their surname. It was always, you know, they were referred to by their surname. So I've never found out Baxalis's first name. But he worked with my uncle. I think he was my uncle's boss originally at the American Tobacco Company and eventually became president in New York of the American Tobacco Company. And just en passant, I'd like to tell you a rather fun story. As you probably all know, Aristotle Onassis' father was a tobacco merchant. And my uncle always told the story uh, about Aristotle's father coming to him and saying, I've got a son, 15, still at school. All he wants to do is leave school and earn a living. Haven't you got a job for him? And my uncle said, no, we're fully, you know, we've got full employment at, at the factory. He said, well, I'll make tea, I'll write letters, I'll post stamp, post letters, I'll write, I'll you know, do stamps and everything. And my uncle said, no. And eventually he said, oh, all right, send them to me. So Aristotle Onassis started his career, never mentioned in books, on a Saturday morning when he wasn't at school, working for the American Tobacco Company licking stamps, posting letters, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, uh, after the um, Second World War, Baxel East was walking down Fifth Avenue and he bumped into Aristotle Onassis, the two men from Smyrna, because obviously Baxel East had left, uh, I presume after 22, I'm not quite sure what date. And as I say, that was when my uncle took over, I don't know if immediately, but became head of the tobacco. This is just by the way, a little piece of interesting, especially for Joanna and David in a sense, but it, it's not the same family, but Joanna had the interest in the American Tobacco Company. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Liz, while, while you're on, um, a question from uh, James Bone. Balladour related to the French PM? Yes, but in great denial. <laughs> it's a very interesting story. He has always denied, uh, A, that he came, he was actually born in Smyrna. I think he left at the age, I wrote him once, so that's why I kind of researched a bit of it. Um, I never got a reply, by the way. Uh, I think he left at the age of six or seven. I can't find much history, and as I think you'll, you know, certainly, Quentin, my cousin, Remo de Andrea, uh, died a couple of years ago, and the papers, I think, um, Brian Giroux's got the papers, I keep meaning to write and say, talk to him. Anyway, um, the Balladur family, I'm told, excuse me, I'm told, and I would suspect, looking at my uncle, looking at his brother Jacques, looking at Nelson, no, sorry, Nelson's a different family, but looking at my own cousin, my first cousin, Denise, there is a certain look in them which would not uh, explain what they've always claimed to be French. And the prime minister claims to be French from Marseille. They are, if you ask me, Armenians who settled in that part much earlier on than, you know, obviously later date of Armenian um, expansion or removed when they're removed to other places. And I don't know why the Balladou, it's a big family. I think you remember, Quentin, we went round the cemetery when we, you know, the title of our date visit to the cemetery was looking for grandpa. Um, and it, there were so many Balladours there. I've got them all because you were running to me and saying it's a Balladour, um, Herman Balladour, people I'd never heard of. So obviously it's quite a big family. So to answer, I'm sorry, I didn't catch who it was who asked the question. He is related, but it is in total denial. Whether it's the Armenian part of the family, it, I think it would have been Baladurian. Whether he doesn't want to be traced back to that or whatever it is, I don't know. He never replied to me, but he always denies it. I've seen interviews with him where he said, no, he was from Marseille. He doesn't say he was born in Smyrna or his family lived there. Okay. Ah, very interesting, thank you. Um, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Ahmed. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I would like to make a comment or uh, give some information. Uh, you're talking about extraterritorial uh, people. Uh, 
but mine is, my family is an intra-territorial, so from Kalar, uh, an important uh, family of uh, tobacco growers and uh, exporters. Uh, they had uh, over 12 warehouses, uh, eight of them are still standing up today. And uh, it's uh, the, the name of the uh, my grand great grandfather is uh, Haji Shakira. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, and uh, his son is Ibrahim Pasha, connected to the uh, to uh, the Sultan because he was he was a, a Pasha. And uh, his son, my grandfather. Uh, Hussein Hüsnü, then became Hussein Kavalalı, was very instrumental in the development of uh, the tobacco business in Turkey. But before coming uh, to Turkey in Kavala, uh, he was the chairperson of the, uh, which you showed uh, a cover page of the 1911 Kavala Tobacco Congress. And he was the, uh, the chairperson there. Uh, and uh, and he, he, he was also, uh, he set up the workers' union and he was uh, the honorary chairman. They, they selected him as, as the honorary chairman of the workers' union. So he had a, a, a very good connection with the workers, with business. And uh, he, he, then he came to Turkey, of course, in 1912. They had to... Uh, to, to leave Kavala for, for Egypt, uh, stay there uh, for, for two years as the uh, guest of the Hidiv, very close friend of uh, his father. And uh, later they, they, they formed a, a, a bank in Istanbul. Anyway, uh, then they came to Istanbul uh, and uh, he was uh, for four years the, the chairperson of the, um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but in the meantime, he went to, to Kavala for the exchange. He stayed there for eight months and brought all the people uh, from, from Kavala to, to, to Turkey. And definitely, regarding the question uh, of the tobacco uh, industry uh, or the becoming uh, a, a, main, uh, a main agricultural item in Turkey, uh, he was instrumental in that, in, 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 uh, in tracing all these people who know the trade, who knew the agriculture, to specific places and, uh, and, uh, and grew the tobacco business in Turkey. And one, one, one last item is I have a note from my grandfather saying that the export from, uh, from Kavala was uh, 5 million uh, gold units or whatever that is, <laughs> whatever that is. But it's it's a it's a huge amount for the for those times. Anyway, this is this is my story. I have uh, no questions. But <laughs> are you, so you related to Mehmet Kavala? Then no, uh, I think there is a, a relationship with my, my grandmother, uh, grandmother's family. That's what I hear. But no, no direct connection with my grandfather. No. And did your family have any connection with the Kobakizade family, which was also uh, very active in, in Kavala? Well, 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 probably, probably. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have uh, much uh, documentation from, uh, from my family, but for, for the last past three years, I've been digging into it <laughs> in Kavala and in Turkey, in the Ottoman archives. Uh, but... Uh, most probably they would have uh, connections with me. I will look through the, um, there are two Congresses, one in 1910 and one in 1911. And uh, my, I mean, there are names there, uh, both from agriculture and, and trade and, and workers. I mean, it's a, it's a co combined, yeah. uh, combined Congresses. I have the full translation of the first one I don't have the full translation of the second one, but uh, I will. I will check, and I will let you know if if there are any connections. Okay. Yeah, it's really a great uh, <laughs> document. It, it, some of the Greek, both on the Greek and the Turkish side, you can trace some of these names. 
uh, for example, on the Greek side, there is a merchant who becomes one of the one of those who dominates the industry in Kavala after the population exchange. And mm -hmm. he was present and an active member in the Congress in 1911. So these connections are, are very important to trace. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much for listening. <laughs> you. So and, and we will go in, back to Kavala, Ahmed. Hello, yes. Maria? I said we should go back to Kavala together again. Yes, yes, we should. <laughs> I'm waiting for the uh, Greeks to uh, to open up the uh, uh, the travel arrangements. Yeah, because we, we are we are vaccinated with the Chinese, unfortunately. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> not not much much of a chance nowadays. Okay, are we? Uh, James uh, Bone has a question. Yes, I just have a question um, for Hernan about um, Onassis. Are you much interested in Anassis or not really, yes, in his part in the tobacco business? I am interested, uh, but not as knowledgeable as I'd like to be. So if you have something... The, the, reason, the reason I say that is that my grandfather knew Anassis and wrote a biography of him. And in the biography, there's a story about how Anassis handled the burning of Izmir in 1922 and how he, he handled that whole period. And it's quite different from any other story I've seen about how Anassis handled all that. And I know that my grandfather knew him and spent time on his yacht with him to do that book. And so I just wanted to make you aware that if you are interested in that period, um, I mean, I can probably get you the, the pages. It's only a few pages of the biography dealing with that, but it is quite an extraordinary and different story than any other account I've seen. And I'm pretty sure it came from the horse's mouth. So it might be interesting for you. I would love to read it. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll try okay. and get in touch with you and and have you uh, send. It okay, to I'll send you. I'll send you the pages when I'm next to it in London. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll connect you up. Um, um, just talking about records. Um, yeah, are the records quite good for your research, Herman? And and what else are you looking for? I would say that the records are too good <laughs> because the collection of commercial court records in Salonika is one of the few that is uh, extent to a large extent. Um, most of the Ottoman commercial court records in other cities are, are not available or no one knows where they are or whatever. The only other uh, one that I know of is Damascus where um, those records are still mostly intact. So the fact, just that alone, is a, is a huge factor because I have thousands of pages of documents to read at any given time, which is daunting, but it's also greatly encouraging because I always have something to work with. Um, and that's the meat and potatoes of my research is those commercial court documents because, as I've been trying to demonstrate, my interest is in commercial culture, business culture, and so on. That said, uh, the Bashkokan look or the Turkish archive side of things is, is also really helpful, um, but there are a number of gaps, mostly in terms of family histories. So the families that I mentioned, I'm always looking for new documentation on um, their involvement in tobacco. And this, some of the conversation we were having earlier about these American companies is also, uh, for whatever reason, that has been something that's been difficult for me to track down. Um, I thought that that would be the easier part of this, this research, but it hasn't been. So those are some of the things I'm still looking for. Um, Greek family records too are something that have been hard to come by. I have Greek bills of exchange. Uh, I have Greek newspapers. Uh, I have Ladino newspapers, but I don't have a lot of Greek family papers on the tobacco industry uh, for these years, right? So in the 1930s, 1940s, the documentation sort of picks up on that end. But for these earlier years, uh, the, the family papers between Greek speaking merchants is, is lacking at least on, on the Salonika side of things and not really present at all in the Bashpakan, like the Turkish archives. Okay, well, if uh, anyone can help with that, um, simplest thing to do is get in touch with me or with Craig and we can pass uh, it on to Herman. Uh, and uh, 
those uh, who uh, would like a direct connection, I know David Clark, James Bone, um, happy to do that. And Ahmed, do, would you like to connect with Herman? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll 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 make the connections uh, there. Um, our time is up, but so Helen, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk and and uh, discussion afterwards. And thank you everyone for turning up and uh, uh, joining in. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much.